Hi, fourth grade. We're going to read some more Farmer Boy by Laura Ingalls Wilder. We're going to be reading Follow the Year, which starts on page 275. Winds in the north, Father said at breakfast, and clouds coming up. We better get the beech nuts in before it snows. The beech trees grew in the timber lot two miles away by the road, but only half a mile across the fields. Mr. Webb was a good neighbor and let Father drive across his land. Amonzo and Royal put on their caps and warm coats. Alice put on her cloak and hood, and they rode away with Father in the wagon to gather the beech nuts. When they came to a stone fence, Amonzo helped to take it down and let the wagon through. The pastures were empty now. All the stock were in the war was in the warm barns, so they could leave the fences down until the last trip home. In the beech grove, all the yellow leaves had fallen. They lay thick on the ground beneath the slim trunks and delicate bare limbs of the beeches. The beech nuts had fallen after the leaves and lay on top of them. Father and Royal lifted the matted leaves carefully on the pitchforks and put them nuts and all into the wagon. And Alice and Amonzo ran up and down in the wagon, trampling down the rustling leaves to make room for more. So just like with the hay, right? They needed to make room for all the hay. This is the same thing. They really just want the beech nuts. So if they run across the leaves, it's going to break up the leaves. And then they're going to be able to fit more and more beech nuts in the wagon. When the wagon was full, Royal drove away with Father to the barns, but Almanzo and Alice stayed to play and play till the wagon came back. A chill wind was blowing and the sunlight was hazy. Squirrels frisked about, storing away nuts for the winter. High in the sky, the wild ducks were honking, hurrying south. It was a wonderful day for playing wild Indian all among the trees. When Almanzo was tired of playing Indian, he and Alice sat on a log and cracked beech nuts with their teeth. Beech nuts are three-cornered and shiny brown and small, but every shell is solidly full of meat. They are so good that nobody could ever eat enough of them. At least Almanzo never got tired of eating them before the wagon came back. Then he and Alice trampled down leaves again while the busy pitchforks made a patch, made the patch of bare ground larger and larger. It took almost all day to gather all the beech nuts. In the cold twilight, Almanzo helped to lay up the stone fences behind the last load. All the beech nuts in their leaves made a big pile on the south barn floor beside the fanning mill. That night, Father said they'd seen the last of Indian summer. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before, but usually that means really nice weather into late, you know, late portions of the fall. And then, um, so it usually lasts, you know, like really nice warm, warm weather through, you know, like October, through the end of October. They usually call that an Indian summer, meaning you get an extra little bit of summer. It will snow tonight, he said. Sure enough, when Almanzo woke next morning, the light had a snowy look, and from the window he saw the ground and barn roof white with snow. Father was pleased. The soft snow was six inches deep, but the ground was not yet frozen. Poor man's fertilizer, Father called such a snow, and he set Royal to plowing it into the fields. It carried something from the air into the ground that would make the crops grow. Meanwhile, Almanzo helped Father. They tightened the barn's wooden windows and nailed down every board that had loosened in the summer's sun and rain. They banked the walls of the barn with straw from the stalls, and they banked the walls of the house with clean, bright straw. They laid stones on the straw to hold it snug against the winds. They fitted storm doors and storm windows on the house just in time. That week ended with the first hard freeze. So their homes are not made like our homes. You know, their homes are stick-built. Their homes are, you know man-made but not with materials that are made in a factory they're getting the wood directly from the you know from the from the woods and they're you know they're building it themselves so they don't have you know the um insulation that we do in our walls to keep everything nice and snug and warm in the house so they have to put straw and i, I don't know if you've ever seen that before but some houses some people will put bales of hay around the outside of their homes to kind of keep the drafts from getting in because they have you know some open spaces so that's what they're doing they're tightening the boards they're putting up storm windows meaning an extra window on top of the other window so that way um it'll keep it warmer and then they're putting all the hay or the straw around the outside to keep it to help keep the barns and the house nice and warm during the winter bitter cold weather had come to stay and now it was butchering time in the cold dawn before breakfast Almanzo helped royal set up the big iron cauldron near the barn they set it on stones and filled it with water and lighted a bonfire under it. It held three barrels of water. Before they had finished, Lazy John and French Joe had come, and there was time to snatch only a bite of breakfast. Five hogs and a yearling beef were to be killed that day. 
As soon as one was killed, Father and Joe and John dipped the carcass into the boiling cauldron and heaved it out and laid it on boards. With butcher knives, they scraped all the hair off of it. Then they hung it up by the hind feet in a tree and cut it open and took all the insides out into the tub. Almanzo and Royal carried the tub to the kitchen and Mother and the girls washed the heart and liver and snipped off all the bits of fat from the hog's insides to make lard. They didn't waste any part of really anything. So all parts of the animal was going to be used in some way, shape, or form um, So because they, didn't, they just were not wasteful. Father and Joe skinned the beef carefully. The hide came off in one big piece. Every year, Father killed a beef and saved the hide to make shoes. <clears throat> all that afternoon, the men were cutting up the meat, and Amonzo and Royal were hurrying to put it all away. All the pieces of fat pork they packed in salt in barrels down cellar. The hams and shoulders they slid carefully into barrels of brown pork pickle, which Mother had made of salt, maple sugar, salt, pe salt peter, and water boiled together. Pork pickle had a stinging smell that felt like a sneeze. So the, all this is going to preserve the meat so that, because remember, they don't have refrigeration or, or freezers. So down cellar is the coldest, down cellar and in the attic and um, in some places in the barn are the coldest places. They're going to store their meat where it can stay nice and cold. Spare ribs, backbones, hearts, livers, tongues, and all the sausage meat had to go into the woodshed attic. Father and Joe hung the quarters of beef there too. The meat would freeze in the attic and stay frozen all winter. Butchering was finished that night. French Joe and Lazy John went whistling home with fresh meat to pay for their work, and Mother baked spare ribs for supper. Amanda loved to gnaw the meat from the long, curved, flat bones. He liked the brown pork gravy, too, on the creamy mashed potatoes. All the next week, Mother and the girls were hard at work, and Mother kept Almanzo in the kitchen to help. They cut up the pork fat and boiled it in big kettles on the stove. When it was done, Mother strained the clear, hot lard through the white cloths into big stone jar jars. So the lard is what she will use to um, to cook her um, donuts in. So she, that's what she'll, the lard is what she uses to fry things. Crumbling brown cracklings were left inside the cloth after Mother squeezed it, and Amanzo sneaked a few and ate them whenever he could. Mother said they were too rich for him. She put them away to be used for seasoning cornbread. Then she made the head cheese. She boiled the six heads until the meat came off the bones. She chopped it and seasoned it and mixed it with liquor from the boiling and poured it into six quart pans. When it was cold, it was like jelly, for a gelatin had come out of the bones. Next, Mother had mincemeat, made mincemeat. She boiled the best bits of beef and pork and chopped them fine. She mixed in raisins and spices, sugar and vinegar, chopped apples and brandy, and she packed two big jars full of mincemeat. It smelled delicious, and she let Almanzo eat the scraps left in the mixing bowl. All this time, he was grinding sausage meat. He poked thousands of pieces of meat into the grinder and turned the handle round and round for hours and hours. He was glad when that was finished. Mother seasoned the meat and molded it into big balls, and Amonzo had to carry all those balls into the woodshed attic and pile them up on clean cloths. They would be there frozen all winter, and every morning Mother would mold one ball into little cakes and fry them for breakfast. The end of butchering time was candle making. Mother scrubbed the big lard kettles and filled them with bits of beef fat. Beef fat doesn't make lard. It melts into tallow. While it was melting, Amonzo helped string the candle molds. So remember, tallow is the grease that they use on their moccasins and their boots to keep them waterproof well tallow also can be used to make candles a candle mold was two rows of tin tubes fastened together and standing straight up on six feet there were 12 tubes in a mold they were open at the top but tapered into a point at the bottom and in each point there was a tiny hole mother cut a length of candle wicking for each tube she doubled the wicking across a small stick and twisted it into a cord she licked her thumb and finger and rolled the end of the cord into a sharp point when she had six cords on the stick, she dropped them into the six tubes, and the stick lay on top of the tubes. The points of the cords came through the tiny holes in the points of the tube in the points of the tubes. Sorry, I said that twice. Through the tiny holes in the points of the tubes, and Alonzo pulled each one tight and held it tight by sticking a raw potato on the tube's sharp point. When every tube had its wick held straight and tight down its middle, Mother carefully poured the hot tallow. She filled every tube to the top. Then Almanzo set the mold outdoors to cool. When the tallow was hard, he brought the mold in. He pulled off the potatoes. Mother dipped the whole mold quickly into the boiling water and lifted the sticks. Six candles came up on each stick. Then Almanzo cut them off the stick. 
He trimmed the ends of wicking off the flat ends, and he left just enough wicking to light on each pointed end. And he piled the smooth, straight candles on, in waxy white piles. All one day, Almanzo helped Mother make candles. That night, they had made enough candles to last till butchering time next year. So they make all their candles for an entire year in one day with the, the tallow that they were able to get from the animals that they butchered. Alrighty, I really hope you're enjoying this book, and I will be back to read some more next week. Have a great day. Bye.